Hello, everybody. This is Unai Gastelumendi, a collaborator of Frankia, the Spanish speaking leading financial community. Today, with us, I'm glad we have Jim Rickards, the author of many books, and um, especially his uh, last one. We are going to talk about it The New Great Depression. He's uh, been so kind of as for accepting this interview and talking about his book and many other um, areas that. I would like to explore with him. Thank you for joining us, Jim. Thank you, and I. Great to be with you. I'd like to start with a topic that you delve a lot in in your book, that is uh, the anti-COVID measures that different governments and politicians have um, implemented. You are kind of very critical to the official narrative. We like that. But the question is, uh, we know that the politicians are not the sharpest knives in the in the drawer, right? Right. But is there any is there anything more to that? Is there because they cannot be that reckless? So is there an agenda behind? Uh, there may be. Um, I wouldn't underestimate the recklessness or maybe just the stupidity of a lot of politicians. But leaving that to one side, uh, I say in my book that lockdowns do not work. You know, closing restaurants, bars, nail salons, bodegas boutique shopping, closing all these things down, does not work to stop the spread of the virus. It does destroy the economy. And that's what we've done repeatedly, now doing it again in the United States right now. Um, and I, there was evidence to support that view last spring. I wrote most of the book in May, June, a little bit July. Then I was able to update it a little bit in October. So it's, it's very fresh, you know, as it comes out now. But that evidence was there in, in uh, last May and June, and I said that in the book. Since then, far more evidence has come out to support that view that lockdowns do not work to stop the spread of the virus. Um, and just to give a concrete example, in the United States, we have 50 states. There was never a national lockdown. Each state, each governor made up his own rules or her own rules. So you had some states like California, New York, that had extreme lockdowns. You had states like Florida that had a moderate lockdown. And then you had states like South Dakota that had no lockdown. The, the governor just said, well, we're going to leave it to, we're going to educate people, but we'll let people make their own decisions. The same was true around the world. Um, Korea had an extreme lockdown. Uh, Sweden had a moderate lockdown, I would say. And other countries did very little at the beginning, Brazil in particular, but there were other examples. But here's the point. We have now had enough time to look at, and there are scientific papers by top scientists, you know, the professor of medicine at Stanford University and collaborators. This is not fringe theory. These are the, the top scientists in the world. I uh, have looked at data from 30 major countries and the 50 states in the United States. And what they've discovered is that there is no correlation between lockdown policies and caseload and fatalities, that lockdowns have no material impact on the number of cases or the number of people who die. Uh, so, which is another way of saying that lockdowns don't work. You can have no lockdown, a moderate lockdown, or an extreme lockdown. You will get the same results in terms of the disease, but you will get very different results in terms of the economy. So you're destroying the economy for no gain. Uh, and again, this is very clear. I, I, I cite studies in my book, um, but recently there's something called the Great Barrington Declaration. It's available online. Uh, more than 3,000 scientists have subscribed to it, you know, signed up to it. And it says exactly what I'm saying, which is that lockdowns do not work. They do not stop the spread of the disease. So you might ask, well, why are politicians doing it? And that really was part of your question. Um, yeah. The answer is they're politicians. They have to be seen to be doing something. Uh, they don't understand the disease. They don't understand immunology, but they do understand politics. Uh, so they've made people afraid. They've made people live in fear unnecessarily, I would say. Uh, I don't underestimate the impact of the pandemic. It's all around me here in the United States and, and where you are and around the world. It's fatal. I understand that. But all you really have to do, wash your hands frequently, um, social distance, you know, so separate tables in restaurants. Um, and masks, a little more controversial, but, but wearing a mask is a very low cost exercise. It doesn't cost much. Uh, it may not be that effective, but it doesn't cost anything. So, uh, so, so wear a mask, okay? Those three things will give you all of the benefit 
uh, at a very low cost. Um, but as far as there's no evidence that seating in restaurants spreads the disease, uh, no evidence that going to school spreads the disease. Children are more exposed at home than they are in school because children don't get it, basically. So if you have a lot of kids, you're not going to spread the disease. But if you keep kids around adults at home, they're more likely to get it. So we've um, and lockdowns kill people, uh, killed a lot of people. Um, suicide rates have tripled. Murder rates in U.S. cities have doubled. Um, drug abuse is up. Alcohol abuse is up. Domestic violence is up. Uh, depression, anxiety, anger, all these things have come because of the lockdown. And I would say that the riots we saw in U.S. cities and elsewhere around the world last summer and the recent uh, mob activity riot on Capitol Hill in the United States, they, they, they have political causes, they claim. But I wouldn't underestimate the extent to which this is part of the damage of the lockdown, that, that the anger and the anxiety and the depression are so great that it makes people more inclined to commit those kinds of acts. And I would expect that to continue. So lockdown, I, I call it the greatest economic blunder in history. And I believe the, the evidence bears that out. Yes, that's why maybe it makes sense to look it through uh, an agenda. I don't know, but going uh, more in detail about the damages that you were just talking about, the financial economic damages beyond the, I, I totally agree about the raising diseases, suicides, drug abuse, that's uh, in Europe, the, it's the same picture. Mm -hmm. So um, you describe in your book as well that uh, monetary policy is kind of uh, exhausted. Fiscal yep. policy seems doesn't seem to, to um, gain traction because you elaborate a lot about uh, the velocity of money. So looking at the future, I, I've been reading some papers about central bank bank digital currencies, CBDCs, okay, so yep. papers from BOE, e ECB. Uh, is that in store in the future so that everybody of us will have a digital wallet with a central bank bypassing the commercial banks because they don't want to lend because the risk profiles, they, they, are, uh, they are not adequate and they have their, their own solvency issues. So is, is that in store that they will kind of articulate a certain fiscal policy on steroids directly uh, through the central banks? Well, first of all, I would say that everybody in the world already has a digital wallet. It's called a credit card. Uh, I, I have some. I suppose uh, you and, and, and the viewers uh, uh, do as well. Um, or, uh, uh, you know, a, an iPhone or a, a cell phone is, is, in effect, a digital wallet. Uh, central bank digital currencies um, are, I always say the dollar is the greatest cryptocurrency in the world. The, the last time the United States Treasury issued a paper note, a treasury note, was 1980. So since then, yeah, I may have a few dollars in my wallet, but uh, the overwhelming majority of all dollar transactions and payments, foreign exchange, trading, et cetera, are digital. And all that message traffic is already encrypted. So the dollar is the leading cryptocurrency in the world today. The blockchain, I mean, that technology has been around for 40 years. It's not, it's not that big a deal. Uh, you know, it, it's, it has some applications, but the blockchain by itself doesn't make anything more or less useful. It's just an efficient way of keeping records. Uh, but when it comes to digital currencies, these central bank digital currencies, what's really going on is they want to eliminate cash. So a digital euro is still a euro. A digital dollar is still a dollar. Uh, you know, a digital Swiss franc is still a Swiss franc. It's not as if they've uh, eliminated the currency. But by going to a fully digital mode, and blockchain may be behind it, and we may have you know we already have debit cards and credit cards and you know when i get uh you know royalties from my publisher they wire it to my bank account they don't they don't send me a check etc uh the point being um that uh if you take that further what they really want to do is eliminate cash now why do they want to eliminate cash for two reasons number one um the, if you want to go to negative interest rates or if you want to freeze accounts confiscate accounts or go to negative interest rates, which is a slow motion confiscation, um, the easiest way to avoid that is to, is to go down to the bank and take all your money out in cash and then put it in a safe place. And for example, if I have $100,000 in the bank and you put on a 1% negative interest rate, I come back a year later, I've only got $99,000 because uh, you took away 1%. But um, if I have 100,000 in cash in a safe place, I go back a year later, I still have $100,000. You have not been able to take it from me. So if you want to have negative interest rates, 
you have to get rid of cash because that is a way to protect your wealth. So, uh, so the digital currencies are a stalking horse, if you will, for a bigger movement to get rid of cash completely. So once everyone's digital, I like to say if, if you're going to slaughter pigs, you have to get them into a pen first. You have to herd them together and then lead them to the slaughter. Well, if you want to slaughter savers, you have to herd them into a digital pen so that they can be slaughtered with confiscation taxes and negative interest rates, et cetera. So that's what's behind it, number one. Number two, um, what the global elites really want, uh, and you see this in um, Klaus Schwab, who's the leader of the global elites, the head of founder of, uh, of the World Economic Forum and the Davos Conference, et cetera, which is sort of a little treehouse for the for the global elite, you know, uh, conspiracies. Um, what what they want is is a global a global currency, global governance, and global taxation. They know these things are unpopular and they're not there yet, but they're working on them. Well, if you have a a completely digital euro and a completely digital dollar and a digital um, uh, Swiss franc, for example, or Japanese yen, any of them, and no more cash, so now. Uh, how difficult would it be just to say, well, now we're going to have a digital world money. The IMF special drawing right is a good candidate, SDR. And yeah, we'll, we'll have exchange rates, so it'll be worth a certain number of dollars or a certain number of euros. But we're going to require the, you know, the, the 500 largest corporations in the world to keep their books and records in SDRs. We're going to say the oil will be priced in SDRs, you know, et cetera. All foreign exchange transactions will be in SDRs, et cetera. So now... Instead of a gold standard, you have the SDR standard, and all the currencies can be pegged to the SDR. But what it really means is that you only have one currency, which is the digital SDR. So th these are this can't be done overnight. This can't be done in one one step. But the, the the central bank digital currencies are a large step in the direction of one eliminating cash and two converging on um, a global currency, which would be the special drawing right. Now, they can't come out and say that. Uh, they actually kind of do. I mean, Mark Carney has said it. I always say that when people are um, imposing dictatorship or, or stealing your money, you know, or uh, imposing unpopular forms of governance, they always tell you what they're going to do. The problem is nobody believes them or, or they do it in such technical jargon that people don't understand. I was actually trained in international economics and law, so I sometimes I feel like an interpreter, like I go into the jungle I, I hear the language and then I come back and sp and speak it in plain English. I, I feel like I'm a, uh, an anthropologist to the uh, global elite in some ways, but um, but they do tell you what they're going to do. But but it's very technical and you have to you know sort of sort through it. But that's coming. Uh, Klaus Schwab has a new book. It's called COVID-19: The Great Reset. Uh, this is the playbook for the global plan that I just described. It's it's. You know, it's not long. It's about 180 pages or so. Uh, I read it. It was one of the scariest books I've ever read. It's like a Stephen King novel. Uh, but it but it basically is the plan for everything we're talking about. And now that Trump has been pushed aside, he was he was almost the last person standing in the way of this. And they're using the COVID-19 pa panic as a uh, as a pretext or a screen to push the same plan they've always wanted. Now, interestingly, until recently, they had, until about a year ago, they had been using climate change. You know, climate, well, the climate, you know, the planet's warming up and we're all gonna die and the whole world's gonna catch on fire. And so we have to have global governance, global taxation and global money. Climate change was, I, I like to say, if you have a, um, if you want a global solution, you need a global problem. Right. Most problems are not global because, you know, taxation, you know, Spain can have one tax policy, the United States can have another tax policy, Ireland and so forth. Uh, that's not a global problem. But climate change is global. First of all, the climate change science is greatly um, uh, is fraudulent. Their climates do change. I used to live on a body of water that 10,000 years ago was a glacier, uh, has a rocky coast because it, used, it was a glacier in the Ice Age. But that's 10,000 years. I mean, that, that's how climates change. So there is climate change, but it's very slow, very unpredictable. It's driven by solar cycles, volcanoes, and things that have nothing to do with CO2 emissions. But, uh, but climate change became the favorite uh, uh, front or, or stalking horse, if you will, because it's a global problem. But it never caught on. People didn't believe it. The science, the science was, a lot of it was phony. Not all of it, but a lot of it. 
But here comes the pandemic. But the pandemic is also global because pandemics don't respect borders. Obviously, this is spread around the world. That's what a pandemic is. So they've now, they said, well, climate change wasn't working. So let's take the pandemic and make that our Trojan horse, if you will, uh, which is what this book is about. But these, these plans are underway. They've, the plans have always been there. That's not new. What is new is the excuse. Uh, and basically, if you can make people afraid, make them fearful, lock them down, destroy their jobs, they become much easier to manipulate. It's great that we have your books for, is the other side of the coin for, that help us navigate in all these uh, plans and all these schemes that uh, certain people, they, they do on, on behalf of, of us. Maybe they think that they do it uh, on behalf of us, uh, not, not on their best interest, but I'm not sure about that. I agree with you. Um, so gold investors in our community, we kind of, um, like gold very much to allocate certain part of our portfolio into it. In this future of digital currencies, these schemas that these uh, certain people have, uh, how do you see, uh, well, owning gold, I think we agree, but afterwards, will they make us hard to convert that gold in a certain future, in a digital world, to allocate it to something else that uh, we would like to, to buy, a big uh, purchase that we need to do? or it would be as, li as liquid as it has always been? Gold will remain as liquid as it's always been. That's one of the great features of gold, even in financial panics and meltdowns and stock market crashes. I've never seen a time when you couldn't buy or sell gold. The price is, the price is volatile, of course. That's, that's part of the idea. But I've never seen a time when there was no bid for gold. That's, that's kind of nonsense. Um, but uh, I, I like a lot of things about gold, but one of them kind of along the lines we've been discussing, it's not digital. It's physical. You can't freeze it on a, with a keyboard. You can't, uh, and by the way, ask yourself, who's buying the most gold in the world right now? Actually, true for the last 10 years, but who's buying the most gold? Russia, China, Iran, Turkey. Uh, I call that the new axis of gold. In other words, these countries are looking forward. They see that um, either the dollar will lose value, which is certainly possible, or that the, the dollar will be the, in the vanguard of this new global currency we're talking about. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you get out of the dollar system? Well, you can't do it with euros. The euro and the dollar are joined at the hip. They're 80% 80, 80 plus of global reserves. Um, there's, there's not going to be a world where the dollar collapses and the euro's going up. I mean, the dollar, the euro, the end, they're all going to collapse together or not. But there's, there's no way that the dollar collapses and all the other currencies don't go down with it. But the one thing that survives is gold. And so if you're an enemy of the United States or you're just worried about the dollar, um, gold is the answer. So it's not digital. It can't be hacked. It can't be erased online. Um, it, it's, it's an element. It can't even be traced. You know, people talk about, um, uh, you know, conflict gold or gold coming from, uh, you know, unsavory mining methods. I don't advocate those methods at all. Uh, I, I invest in gold mines and they're, they're very environmentally sound and they're very well managed. But you can't tell because it's, it's an element. It's atomic number 79. You melt down gold and recast it, you have no idea where it came from. It doesn't leave any, there's no DNA footprint, there's no digital footprint. So um, for all these reasons, uh, actually it was just discovered somebody hacked uh, a lot of digital records from um, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. And what they discovered is that uh, Hezbollah has um, uh, $500 million worth of gold. Uh, well, that comes as no surprise. If, if the United States and, and Israel uh, and others are trying to uh, freeze your digital bank accounts, gold is the best assets. Again, I'm not, I think Hezbollah is a terrorist group, but, uh, but they're smart enough to know that gold is, is the way to preserve wealth. And the same is true for everyday investors. So that's one thing. But the second thing is that uh, I expect the price of gold, the dollar price of gold to go to at least $10,000 per ounce, but more likely $15,000 an ounce in the next four years or so. Um, and people say, that's a crazy number. You know, where's that come from or whatever? It's not, it's not crazy. It's very, it's very mathematically based and soundly based. Uh, for example, Global money supply, uh, when I say global, so I'm saying United States, ECB, Bank of Japan, Bank of England, China, they're the, they're the big economies, uh, is about $30 trillion. 
um, if you assume 40% gold backing, uh, either a gold standard or just you had to restore confidence in, in central bank currencies, 40% uh, backing should be enough. Uh, historically, it's been more like 20%, but let's assume 40%. So that means you need $12 trillion worth of gold. Well, how much gold do these central banks have? Well, the answer is 35,000 metric tons. So a little, you know, seventh grade math, you just divide $12 trillion by 35,000 metric tons, and you come out to a price of about $15,000 per ounce. Right. So it was $15,000 per ounce is the implied non-deflationary price of gold if you have either a gold standard or uh, people lose confidence in the dollar. So it's not a made up number. And then people say, well, gee, Jim, that seems really far away. But but here's the point. Um, again, very simple math. So right now, gold is about $1,840 an ounce. Let's just call it $2,000 for a round number. So if gold goes from $2,000 per ounce to $3,000 per ounce, that's a 50% increase. But if it goes from $14,000 an ounce to $15,000 an ounce, that's only a 7% increase because you're working off a much higher base. Now, it's the same $1,000. You know, if you have gold, you made $1,000 an ounce in both scenarios. But the point is, at progressively higher levels, each $1,000 increment is a smaller and smaller percentage. 7% volatility, that's like a week's volatility. So this will start out slowly. It'll take a while to get to 3,000 and then 4,000. But once it gathers momentum, you'll find that it's going up $1,000 a week. Uh, it'll look more like a Bitcoin price chart. But the point is in uh, that those, the, those future increments become easier and easier because they represent smaller percentages of the new base. So this starts out slowly, but it gathers momentum. It happens very quickly at the end. All the more reason to have gold today so you can participate in that. And it costs less to buy an ounce today than it will in the future. Couldn't agree more. Um, question about a bit, let's move a bit more local. Um, Spain's GDP. It's um, a big part of it. Uh, it's contributing the tourism because it's, I believe it's the number two um, country in the world after France that, uh, and the number of tourists uh, received. So it's an yep. uh, important industry. Then um, all the restaurants, all the all that goes with it. So this COVID uh, thing like uh, hit into the heart of the Spanish economy and other yep. European uh, economies. So how do you see the coming years for an economy like Spain and uh, middle economies like uh, in Europe? Right. Well, I've, first of all, I've been all over Spain. It's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. I've been from uh, Barcelona, uh, Zaragoza. My, my, my oldest son uh, went to uh, a school in Zaragoza. He's, uh, he's beyond fluent in Spanish. He, I think he thinks in Spanish. Um, wow. But, I've been to Granada, Malaga, uh, the, uh, the Mallorca. So I've been uh, Madrid, of course. I've been many places. It's been absolutely beautiful country. Uh, and yes, a major tourist destination. Well, obviously, it's been badly damaged by the COVID. Uh, we, we know that. So the question is, how and when will it come back? Uh, and I, my expectation is that it will come back very slowly. And this has to do with the behavioral changes I spoke about earlier. So right now, the pandemic is still out of control and lockdowns are still in place and travel restrictions are still in place. And it's very difficult to travel. Um, right now, I'm on a world tour uh, to promote my uh, new book, but I'm doing it digitally. In the past, I would get on a plane. I'd go to Sydney and Melbourne and Vienna and Berlin and Madrid and London and that's how I did my book tour. Now I'm doing it on a computer. We're all in the same situation. But let's just say that the, the pandemic uh, got under control, it kind of went away, which maybe next year, not this year, but maybe next year, and things started to open up. The question is, has behavior changed uh, for decades, perhaps? In other words, just because you can travel, do you want to travel? Is there some ling lingering effect? Is there some residual fear? Um, you know, just because restaurants reopen doesn't mean that everybody wants to go out to a restaurant. Some people Good do, point. But, but we might just be, yeah, you know, I'm kind of, I've changed. I'm used to eating at home. I'm used to getting takeout food. I'm used to not getting on planes, et cetera. So that could actually come back very slowly. Uh, and that's why I call it the new Great Depression. Uh, it doesn't mean declining growth. It does mean growth below trend, uh, weak growth relative to potential. So this is the kind of thing that could linger for 10 years or more. 
Wow, yes, this is what, uh, what I thought uh, as well. Um, you often quote uh, Kim's saying that uh, he would change his opinions, his analysis, if circumstances change, right? right. He's not a st static, dogmatic thinker, okay? Right. So, Bitcoin, has anything changed, any circumstances changed for you to change your stance uh, uh, on Bitcoin? Uh, no, and you write about Keynes. He was, uh, I, I don't consider Keynes an ideologue. I consider him a pragmatist. He, he had different views at different times based on the conditions. I think that's a smart way to proceed. Um, there's a famous story where Keynes was having a debate with Winston Churchill, who at the time was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, and they were having an argument. They didn't agree. And then uh, Churchill sent Keynes a cable. He said, uh, I've finally come around to your, to your point of view. And Keynes said, well, that's unfortunate because I've changed my mind. So, <laughs> but, but you're right about his approach to things. Uh, so um, I, I would say no, and the reason is that nothing has changed. Again, Keynes said, if the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Um, but the facts have not changed. Uh, I mean, the price is higher, I understand that. Uh, but um, Bitcoin is a bubble. It'll crash. Uh, I don't know when. Uh, but, uh, you know, I did an interview in December 2017. Uh, and it actually got more than 1 million views on YouTube, uh, uh, but it was a hot topic at the time. But it was about Bitcoin. At the time, Bitcoin was going up uh, almost $1,000 a day, kind of what I was talking about with, with gold a few minutes ago. So it was $5,000, $6,000, $7,000, $8,000. And so the interviewer asked me about it. I said, well, look, here's what's going to happen. It's going to go to $20,000, and then it's going to crash. And that's exactly what happened. By early January, it was $20,000. And then it crashed about 80% back down to three uh, or $4,000 somewhere in there. Okay, so now it's happened again. It's up, it got up to over $40,000. It's come down a little bit, but I expect it will crash again. Bitcoin has no use case. Um, and and here's, here's a bigger point that people don't understand. So people say, well, Bitcoin is going to replace gold or Bitcoin is going to replace the dollar. It's going to be the new global currency standard, et cetera. And what people don't understand is that um, reserve currencies, they may be denominated in currencies, but they don't consist of currencies. And what I mean by that is we say um, China has $1.4 trillion uh, in its reserve position, $1.4 trillion position. That's true. But it's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They invest in securities. They buy treasury notes, treasury bonds, and treasury bills. So they don't, it, it's denominated in dollars, but it doesn't consist of dollars. It consists of securities denominated in dollars, dollar securities, basically U.S. Treasury securities. Same right. thing with the euro. So where's the Bitcoin bond market? It doesn't exist. Uh, and it won't exist. And I can explain why. Because... This is a good example of how people who are really good at math and computers do not understand monetary economics. So the creator of Bitcoin, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he or she is, or if it's not, you know, Raytheon or Lockheed or somebody behind the whole thing, but um, said, we hate central banks. Central banks print too much money. They create inflation. They just print money like crazy. We hate that. So we're going to cap the number of Bitcoin. And they did. That's how the math works. Around uh, 21 million, 22 million bitcoins, uh, but we're close to that. We're we're kind of approaching 18 million. But the the degree of mathematical and computational complexity and the amount of electricity you need to get to each additional bitcoin gets progressively worse. So you'll never get to that number. So effectively, it's capped about where it is. Could go up a little bit, but not not a lot. But here's the thing: that is inherently deflationary, because if you have a set amount of Bitcoin, here's the economy, whatever whatever it is. Now, the economy keeps growing, et cetera, but Bitcoin doesn't. It's fixed at this number. So what that means is that each Bitcoin buys more and more stuff. That's deflation. And that's why very smart people uh, like Paul Paul Jones and uh, Ray Dalio and uh, uh, and others, uh, you know, uh, Glenn Hutchins and, and others, are bullish on Bitcoin because they say, well, with that deflationary bias, uh, each Bitcoin buys you more stuff, so it can only go up. So it's going to, you know, you see forecasts of $50,000, or $100,000. But what they're missing is that you can't be a store of value and you can't be a reserve currency unless you have a bond market, which I just described a few minutes ago. 
but you'll never have a bond market in Bitcoin because why would anybody borrow in a deflationary currency? Deflation means that the real value of the currency goes up. But why? I want to. Debtors want inflation. Great point. Debtors want inflation. I want to borrow an inflationary currency so I can pay you back with with nothing. Um, but deflationary currency, I would never borrow. That means you'll never have a bond market. That means it'll never be a reserve currency. Plus, the central banks will squash it. So, you know, it's a kind of gambling. I prefer roulette because you can have a nice drink and I enjoy the game. But uh, um, I don't. A Bitcoin is it is what it is. If if, if people want to do it, that's fine. I, I believe in. Uh, uh, you know, freedom uh, in terms of people's choices, and I respect that. I don't own it myself. I don't plan to, and I think it has the flaws that I described that will stand in the way of it ever being uh, uh, playing a role in the international monetary system. But that doesn't mean if people want to gamble with it. That's fine. Great uh, explanation, monetary one to complement. I agree with you. This the tech-oriented people need to embed this this explanation of yours to, to have uh, the full picture. So, conscious of the time, uh, Jim, last question. Um, everybody thinks that, I mean, looking at Tesla charts, looking at the whole uh, kind of uh, equities rally, they, that, okay, I'm here, but the moment that things get ugly, I will I would step down and I will cash my, my kind of uh, benefits, my capital gains and everything. Right. So, uh, is, it will be that easy, that is uh, one. And then second question, what do you think, what's your uh, uh, your thoughts about passive investing? That I think both things are, are linked. Right. I, I, I agree completely. Uh, so in the US, our major stock index is the S&P 500. And uh, it's at an all-time high, who knows, as we're speaking, it may have just reached a new all-time high. And people say, well, it recovered the gains from the pandemic, it's reached new all-time highs. My retirement account is is you know fully restored. It's all good, um, but I make the point that uh, the S and P 500 is really the S and P seven. Uh, there are seven stocks that make up that 40 percent of the of the of the capital uh, market capitalization of the value of that index. And as I said, it's uh, you know it's Amazon, Apple, Netflix, uh, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and Tesla. Uh, Tesla is now in the S and P 500. They are the least affected by the pandemic, uh, but Americans, and I think it's true around the world, like index funds. And this goes to your point about passive investing. So I buy an index fund. Uh, what does the manager do with my money? Well, he goes out and buys those stocks. They go up. More money comes in. They buy more. It goes up. More money comes in. They buy more. It goes up and so forth. So it's just a, a, a feedback loop or recursive function. Uh, and it goes up and up and up. It's completely detached from the real economy. The stock market has never been more detached from the real economy than it is today because of things like lockdowns. Small, medium-sized enterprises, as I mentioned, are half the economy, and we're crushing them with these, with these pointless lockdowns. So you have this gap. Here's, here's the perception up here, and here's the reality down here. Reality always wins. Reality always wins. So that gap will close. Now, it can take time. I'm not saying the stock market is going to crash tomorrow, but it will the reality will catch up with the stock market at some point. And then people say, well, fine, I'll just take my gains and sell. Well, when everyone sells at once, we know what happens, which is the market crashes before you can get out. Um, and so you can see that coming. Um, there's some room for equities in the model portfolio, but I would be more like 10 or 20 percent than 80 or 90 percent that most people have. And I think there is a there is a bubble dynamic going on right now, but bubbles last longer than people think. So I would not short the stock market because it's like getting run over by by an 18 wheeler truck. Yeah. But uh, but I wouldn't jump in either. But you know, a lot of people will. Thank you very much, Jim, for your insights. Thank uh, you. I. A Spanish translation for the new new Great Depression is uh, something that you have in mind, your editors? Uh, yes, the, the problem with the, we've sold uh, language rights in 14 languages, the German edition is already up, but here's the problem with Spain. Spanish is so widely spoken and they have such a big literary market that they don't need English titles. The Germans need English titles because they're German's not that widely spoken. Same thing with other, you know, Japanese and other languages, but, but Spain is a huge market. Um, so the, the Spanish rights uh, tend to come out more slowly, but yes, uh, it is in the works. Uh, I will certainly put this on Twitter. My Twitter uh, handle is at James G. Rickards. 
uh, R I C K A R D S at James G Rickards. Uh, so yeah, I hope we do have a Spanish title soon. I expect it, but uh, we are out in in, in in fourteen other languages. Perfect. We will link the um, uh, your book in 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 English for the ones that I'm sure that there are a lot that they cannot wait for the Spanish translation. So like me, that I already read it, so that they can have a uh, direct access. Thank you very much for your time, Jim. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye.